we're looking at Michael Bergman's argument that religious belief can be rational even without arguments supporting the belief. Now, Bergman is following Alvin Plantinga, with whom he studied at Notre Dame, and they are proponents of reformed epistemology. Now, in this part, we lay out the ideas behind it, the arguments for it, and in part two, then, we will look at some objections and Bergman's responses to those objections. So what is reformed epistemology? It does come and uses the word reformed from the idea from John Calvin, who had this idea that uh, goes actually back to Aquinas, and that we have an inner sense of the divine. So let's see how this works. The idea is that religious beliefs can be rational even if they are not based on any arguments. Now, a couple of distinctions need to be made here when we say this. First of all, by labeling, labeling beliefs either rational or irrational, what we're doing is making an evaluative distinction. Rational beliefs are better, obviously, than irrational beliefs. So we're making a normative claim when we're saying that these are rational. Now, on the other hand, we're going to talk about basic beliefs. We'll get into that in the next slide. A basic belief is one that is not based on or inferred from another belief. Now, this is not a normative claim. This is a, a psychological distinction. This has to do with how beliefs are formed. So, two different things to keep in mind as we're looking at basic beliefs. So let's go ahead and do that. What are basic beliefs? So let's start with an example. So suppose my neck hurts, which it often does. It's that belief that I have, if I have it, is not based on something like my flinching when I twist my neck in a certain way. It's not based on looking in the mirror and seeing that I have a pained expression on my face. It's just based on the experience of neck pain, right? So I just have this belief that my neck hurts. It's a basic belief. Now, a non-basic belief might be something that's inferred from other beliefs. So suppose without a calculator, you are figuring out what nine times 53 is, and you come up with 477. You would be correct, but that is based on more primitive calculations. It's based on what nine times five is and what nine times three is, right? And that's an inferred belief from those more basic calculations. At least most people, the vast, vast majority of people don't just see nine times 53 and then the number 477 pops into their head. That's not how it works for most of us. Inferentialism is a certain claim about rationality. And inferentialism is the idea that for any belief to be rational, you must have a reason for holding it. And the reason must be something involving an inference, of course. The belief must be inferred from other beliefs in order to be rational. Now, this isn't classical foundationalism or strong foundationalism, th those allow for some basic beliefs to be proper, but they have to be uh, qualified in a certain way. We'll leave that aside for another time. Inferentialism, though, is this idea for any belief to be rational, you have to have some other beliefs to provide an inference to that belief. Now, Hopefully already you've seen an objection. You could think of an objection to inferentialism. For a belief to be rational, it must be inferred from a rational belief, which of course must be inferred from a rational belief in order for it to be rational. And we have a problem here, right? This requirement for rationality actually leads to a vicious regress. Now either the inference chain is going to be infinite, which of course is going to be impossible for humans to do, or it's going to be circular, 
and circular reasoning is problematic, obviously. So inferentialism implies that it's impossible to have a rational belief. So we reject inferentialism. The reformed epistemologist rejects the claim of inferentialism. That's because it is possible to have a rational belief. Some beliefs are rational to have. So some rational beliefs must be basic and in order to be rational, some of those basic beliefs must be properly basic, both rational and non-inferential. So in order for us to have rational beliefs, we have to have properly basic beliefs. So the reformed epistemologist in rejecting inferentialism says that you have to have some beliefs that are properly basic. They're both rational, but they are not inferred from other rational beliefs. Now, the evidentialist objection, the person who is the opponent, so to speak, of the reformed epistemologist has an argument that goes something like this. When it comes to religious belief, belief in God is rational only if it's inferred from other rational beliefs via good arguments. Now notice that's uh, an inferentialism of a specific kind, right? It's, it's inferentialism, but only regarding beliefs about God here, right? So a belief about God is the kind of belief that's rational only if it's inferred from other rational beliefs via good arguments. And the second claim of the evidentialist uh, is that there are no good arguments for the existence of God, and therefore belief in God is irrational. So this is the objection that the Reformed epistemologist addresses. Now, many theists are going to reject premise two, right, and say there are good arguments for the existence of God, and most theists would point to many arguments for the existence of God that are, are good arguments, maybe the ontological argument, maybe a version of a cosmological argument of which there are, are a few, maybe a, a contemporary design argument or a teleological argument of sort, a moral argument, an argument from religious experience, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? So many theists are just going to question number two and, and provide what they consider to be good arguments for believing in the existence of God. However, the reformed epistemologist focus is on rejecting premise one. The reformed epistemologist says premise one is false. Um, you could have a properly basic belief about God, about God existing. Now the reformed epistemologist uh, might go on to reject premise two. And in fact, Alvin Plantinga thought that there was for example, a good ontological argument for the existence of God. So it, it's not as if the reformed epistemologist just has to be committed to rejecting one. They certainly can and often do reject two as well. But of course, we're gonna focus on why they would reject premise one. So in order to do that, we need to think more carefully about properly basic beliefs or PBBs here, as we're calling them, properly basic beliefs again. And uh, as we've seen, not all, well, we haven't seen this yet, sorry, not all basic beliefs, those that aren't formed from inferences, are rational. Uh, so we have basic beliefs. Some of them fit into the category of being properly basic beliefs, but some of them are not. So a gambler, uh, for example, um, at a craps table who's lost a lot of money just has this belief, well, you know, since I've been losing so much, it's clear that my luck's going to change, you know, or uh, playing blackjack, right? Since I've lost so much money, of course, my luck's going to change. Just one more hand, I'll turn it all around. That is not a properly basic belief. But 
many beliefs, of course, are properly basic. We have non-inferential belief forming abilities. So what kinds of abilities do we have? What types of categories of beliefs might be properly basic or belief forming mechanisms might lead to properly basic beliefs? One would be introspection. So for example, uh, the neck pain example that I gave previously, we can tell what we're feeling. We don't have to infer what we're feeling. Uh, when we're feeling pain or cold, we're feeling cold or too hot or, or our emotions, and we can tell what we're thinking, right? We know what we're thinking just upon reflection. We don't have to infer these kinds of things. Basic logical principles. We can just see that the principle of non-contradiction is true. We can just see that an argument of the form disjunctive syllogism is going to be true. If I say either the, the water is cold or we're going to die of thirst and we're not going to die of thirst, well, we can conclude that the water is cold. Right? A, a simple little, that's a disjunctive syllogism. It's obviously a valid form of reasoning. So is modus ponens, a, a simple if then conditional. Um, if the water's cold, then I will drink it. The water is cold, therefore I will drink it. Apparently I'm thirsty as I'm presenting this, this video. Uh, but we can see these certain logical structures are valid and we just know that, we don't infer that. Beliefs from memory. Um, so what you did yesterday, what you had for supper last night, you don't have to infer that. Now you might have to reflect a little bit, what did I have for supper last night? But if you think carefully, you can probably come up with it, right? And other memory beliefs, of course, it's not that you infer that you did something in the past, you simply remember experiencing it. And then perception, our sensory perception. We just see certain things. I'm having an experience of looking at a, a blue screen with white font on it. I, I just perceive that. I don't have to infer that. I just have that belief because it's something that I'm perceiving. So all of these capacities that we have, these belief forming abilities, might provide properly basic beliefs that are then starting points from which we can infer other beliefs that are going to in turn be rational as long as we're using good arguments. Now, even if those other beliefs are not properly basic or even basic at all, of course. So we can expand our beliefs that are rational based on properly basic beliefs. So we have that category. It's pretty clear. Some of our beliefs are properly basic beliefs. Now, just to clarify, properly basic beliefs are not groundless, right? They're not held without any evidence whatsoever. So for example, the experience of pain is the basis, the grounding, we might say, for your belief that you are in pain. It's not an inference, but there's something there that provides the grounding, the foundation for that belief. Your perceptual experience of, of seeing a lectern, or in this case, a, a blue screen in front of you, is the grounding for your belief that there is a lectern or a blue screen in front of you right? You have that perceptual experience that provides the foundation for your properly basic beliefs. It's not an inference though. It, you can just see that one thing logically follows from another with those logical principles we, we mentioned previously. You have a memory of eating Raisin Bran for breakfast, for example, and that would be the basis of your belief that you had Raisin Bran for breakfast, right? So, Rational beliefs then include properly basic beliefs. They have foundations, they have grounds. It's just that they are not inferred. Now, rational beliefs also would include beliefs inferred from properly basic beliefs. Now, uh, a couple clarifications on, on properly basic belief. A, a person does not need to be able to provide an account of what should or shouldn't be considered a properly basic belief in order to be rational in holding their properly basic belief. So a person need not be reflective on epistemology 
someone who hasn't studied philosophy, hasn't considered epistemology, hasn't thought of or have ever heard the term properly basic beliefs, such a person could still be rational in holding their properly basic beliefs, right? You don't have to provide an account in order for you to be rational. Now, that would be in contrast to confirmationalism. Confirmationalism is the view that in order for beliefs to be rational, whoever's holding it needs to have the further belief that the first belief has an adequate basis. You have to give an account of the basis for your belief. Now, the problem with confirmationalism is similar to the problem we had with inferentialism. It's going to lead to a vicious regress. So we, we don't need to go down that rabbit hole. Now, the reformed epistemologist, including Bergman, of course, claims that belief in God is properly basic. We have a sense of the divine a divinis sensitivus that enables us to form properly basic beliefs about God. So, for example, we just have a disposition to believe. So somebody uh, looks up into the sky at night and the stars, and they, they just have this belief, this vast and intricate universe was created by God. Or suppose they're on a mountainside and they're they're looking out over valleys and other mountains and, and they just have that belief or uh, they have this belief that God forgives me for what I've done after uh, reflecting on what they've done and considering it, recognizing it is wrong and then asking forgiveness. Then they form that belief, God forgives me for what I've done. In both cases, those are not inferred beliefs. We're not talking about a teleological argument, a contemporary design argument or something like that in the first case. We're not talking about religious experience arguments in the second case. They're, the beliefs are just there in certain situations, and Bergman claims that those are properly basic beliefs. In fact, Bergman says belief in God is more like belief in other people than it is like belief in electrons. So you just see other people around you. You just believe that there are other people, right? That those aren't automatons, that, the, that other people have minds like you do, experience the world like you do, right? The sensations and so on. And that is unlike the kinds of inferences we have to make in order to believe in electrons. You don't have a, a basic belief in electrons, right? Now, furthermore, they claim that it wouldn't be surprising for a loving God who wants all people to believe in him to give the ability to believe in him non-inferentially. That would not be surprising because, of course, it, it would be unusual and even cruel for God to only accept beliefs as rational in him if, they've, if people have had the opportunity to consider arguments for the existence of God and reflect on them, right? That way of believing in God, the way we're talking about with the properly basic belief, it's less affected by intelligence. You don't have to be intelligent, you know, in terms of understanding philosophy and, and contemplating uh, arguments. You don't have to have the expertise to evaluate arguments. You don't have to be a philosopher trained to evaluate arguments to have these properly basic beliefs in God, that is to have rational belief, a rational belief that God exists. In part two, we're gonna go on to look at objections and then Bergman's responses to those objections to these ideas.